and talk about the feasts, God's feasts that are in Leviticus 23. Because the more I study these, the more it makes me go, huh, is there something going on that I don't know about as it pertains to God's dealings with man and the calendar that he had set into motion long before I came on the scene. And so with that said, I really, really want to talk about these um, and their significance. I made some notes for the show, so I'd have them in front of me, and I was just going to do a few, and it's 13 pages, and that's just the highlights of the research. And I was like, oh my gosh, there's a book in here. I mean, everybody has a book on this stuff, so I'm like, ah, you know. But just suffice to say, there are seven festivals that are discussed in Leviticus 23. The third book of the Bible. And so I want to go there. Let's turn to Leviticus 23. And let's try to learn something that we didn't already know or add to what we already knew. And, and let's pray before we start. Father, thank you for tonight, for this opportunity to learn and to grow, to teach and to hear. Father, we pray that you would confirm your word with all signs and wonders following. Father, thank you for the move of God in our midst, for the amazing things that you're doing among us. Thank you for fruit for signs and wonders, for creative miracles that are manifesting among us. In the mighty, most powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. In Leviticus 23 and verse 1, it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord. So right away, one of the most important things to remember about these feasts is they weren't Israel's feasts. They weren't Moses's. They weren't the churches. Whose feasts are these? They're God's. So if they're God's feasts, then they're the church's feasts because they're not just for one, they're for all of us. And whether we actually, I'm not saying we go celebrate these in the way that they do, but I'm saying we ought to know about them. And we ought to know how they fit, how they weave in with God's uh, messianic plan of redemption in the church, in the time that we live in. And so in verse 2, it says, concerning the feasts of the Lord. Now this word feasts uh, is actually uh, convocations or rehearsals. So when you read about these feasts, he says, um, speak about the feasts and proclaim about the holy convocations. God is saying, I want you to rehearse yearly what I'm going to do eventually publicly. A rehearsal is practice in preparation for a public performance. So God is saying, guys, I want you to go in and as a group, as a nation, you may be the only ones in the world doing this, but I want you to practice feasts and convocations because eventually I'm going to publicly do what you're privately practicing. Then he says, proclaim these. So it means I want you to talk about them. I don't want you to be silent. I want you to, I want you to talk. Well, and then it says, verse 3, Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in their seasons. But now he's not talking about seasons like we know seasons. Um, in the feasts, there's basically two seasons. There's spring and then there's fall. 
And in the context of festivals, there's seven. And I want to talk about those seven as briefly as we can tonight. Because when you see how they tie into the church age, I, I believe you're going to get real excited. And the more you learn, the more you want to learn. And if nothing else, we're blessing Israel because we're learning about how Israel thinks, and that's always a good thing. And he said, whoever blesses Israel is blessed. And so we're strengthening our affinity for the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. So it's, the first one is in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 5. And it says, in the 14th day of the first month at evening is the Lord's Passover. So the first feast is Passover, and that's the month of Nisan. And that's either March or April, depending on how the calendar goes. And I want you to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. And we can see a New Testament application to this Old Testament festival. <coughs> These first four festivals I'm going to give you are all in the spring season on Israel's calendar. And they have all already prophetically taken place. We study these festivals from a historical perspective uh, and from a prophetic perspective. Historical in the sense that we want it to be a part of our history, we want to continually talk about it. It's part of our root system, it's a part of our tradition. We talk about them prophetically because they're eventually going to take place. What's privately being historically celebrated will eventually be publicly, prophetically de declared. And so we celebrate these first four from a historical perspective because they have already happened. The Passover feast was just exactly what it sounds like. It was, they, they would slay the lamb, put the blood on the doorposts, and the death angel would pass over and Israel was spared when Egypt, the world, was not. And so um, the idea was there was coming a lamb that would be slain, that would be the Messiah, and he would be the Redeemer once and for all. And so every time they celebrated Passover, they were saying, in effect, we are prophesying a Messiah who will eventually be the Passover lamb. This is a regular lamb, but there is one coming who is the lamb, and he will be all of our Passovers, Jew and Gentile alike. Well, they would not recognize that this has happened already, but we do. And so in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, it says this, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. See, we keep it. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leaven is always a, a picture of sin in the Bible. And so our second festival is the festival of unleavened bread. And this is a picture of Jesus' burial. So if we'll go to Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 6, you'll see this second festival. Leviticus 23 and verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month, <coughs> so on the 14th day, you celebrate Passover. The very next day, you celebrate unleavened bread. So what happened when Jesus was crucified? It happened on the first day. And then his burial was the very next day. And so just in the same way that they would have celebrated Passover, the next day they would celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Well, we do too. Christ, his burial, is our Unleavened Bread Festival. And it says in uh, verse 6, On the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Well, when Jesus goes into the ground 
That is our celebration of unleavened bread. Sin is removed. Jesus became sin. There was no leaven in the lump. There was no sin in us anymore once Jesus went down and was buried. In the context of that's what made it possible for us to have no sin. You, know, you have to get born again. But Jesus' burial is what removed the sin out of the equation. The third festival is found in Leviticus 23.10, and that's the first fruits picture, or it's the first fruits festival, or feast. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When you be come into the land which I give unto you, and reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Well, this was uh, satisfied in 1 Corinthians 15 and 20 because Jesus is the first fruits from the dead. The new land that we were all looking for is the, is the land of salvation. And so when Jesus comes up from the grave, born again and resurrected, righteous, he is the first to be resurrected righteous. See, Jesus wasn't the first person to be resurrected um, from the dead. There were several people resurrected from the dead before Jesus ever showed up. A lot of people don't maybe consider that or think about that, but Jesus was the first person to be resurrected righteous or right with God. The others were still in their sins, but Jesus was not. And so in 1 Corinthians 15 and 20, it says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And so our prophetic fulfillment of the third feast of Israel, and guys, they did this. I mean, they celebrated these feasts for thousands of years. I mean, they practiced them and practiced them and practiced them and practiced them and practiced them. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes along and he fulfills them. That, that's significant, especially when you start looking at these last three that are about to take place. So the next festival we want to look at is the Feast of Weeks. And this is found in Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 16. Leviticus chapter 23 In verse 16. <coughs> Even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number 50 days, and you shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. This is commonly called the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. Weeks meaning origins. That word means origins or beginnings. And don't you think it's ironic that on uh, Acts chapter 2, if you go over there, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, 50 days after Jesus went to the cross, or excuse me, 50 days after he was resurrected, 50 days after the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread, or pardon me, the Feast of the First Fruits, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit and began or originated the church. God is specific to the very day. Um, I also want to mention this too. I found this. Um, Jesus was crucified at the same time of day when they were killing the lambs for the evening sacrifice on Passover. He fulfilled it even to the very hour, not just the very day. So all four of these festivals or practices or rehearsals have already taken place. Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, and Pentecost. There, those were all in the spring, and they all took place relatively close to one another. I mean, fi huh? 
So it's the first fruits of Easter? Uh, yeah, pass, Passover. <coughs> Excuse me. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits are all three days in a row, back to back to back. And that's our Easter celebration. No, that's okay. I, I've been drinking a while. shouldn't have any problem with it, but <coughs> yeah, anyway. Um, so those all took place in the spring. Then a long period of time passes until the fall festivals. And even that long period of time is to be prophetically significant of the, of the church age, the age of grace. And so in the same way that there's tremendous distance between Pentecost and the next feast, which is the Feast of Trumpets, which is what we're in now, uh, there is a long period of time. And so God is even doing the same thing with the church that he does with the festivals. But now we are entering into the fall season on God's clock. And I think that we underestimate how significant that is on so many levels, which is why I'm digging and digging and digging and digging into these things out of the Old Testament to bring them up to the New Testament to get a little bit, a little bit more oomph, a little more bang for our buck on, hey, win your neighbor, because they might, you might not be around tomorrow to do it. They definitely might not be around. You, you most definitely might not be around. You know, it, when you're outside of the covenant of God, you're not promised tomorrow. But when you're in the covenant of God, you are promised tomorrow so long as he doesn't return. As long as you're walking with God, he promises to give you long life and to satisfy you with salvation. And the number of your days he will fulfill. And there'll be well days. And as long as he doesn't return and you aren't satisfied, then you are promised tomorrow. But if you're outside of that covenant, you're not promised tomorrow be gone right now because you are basically at the mercy of Satan. I mean, you are, and he, you know, barring the grace of God, he could just snatch you up. And so we want to get more bang for our buck in our evangelism and in our outreach. And this is one surefire way to do it is to create a picture of how close to the return of Jesus Christ that we are, even based on his festivals. And so if you look at, um, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 24, you'll see this next festival, and this is the one that begins in the fall. And what I find rather remarkable is it begins with the sound of a trumpet. Leviticus 23 and verse 24. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And, I, you know, I found this in, in part of my research that I really think is worth hearing. And it's an on, online article, and it says God has always had a heart to warn people before he executes judgment. He warned the people before the flood, before Nineveh. And the Feast of Trumpets reflects God's desire to summon his people to repentance so that he can vindicate them on the day of his judgment. The Feast of Trumpets fell on the first day of the seventh month, a month which stood out in religious year as a sabbatical month that ushered in the last three feasts, namely Trumpets, Atonement, and Tabernacle. These feasts, which became known as the High Holy Days, mark the conclusion of the religious year and typify the conclusion and consummation of the plan of redemption. The number seven, which is woven into the biblical calendar, represents in Scripture completion and termination. This meaning is accentuated in the feasts of the seventh month since they completed the yearly cycle of sacrifices and harvest. The Feast of Trumpets heralded the blowing of trumpets the final phase of the Jewish religious year, which as we will see, 
is typologically brought to completion, God's plan for the final disposition of sin and the inauguration of a new world. The first part of this, the theme is the feast, and it's the divine judgment and mercy of God. We, we're going, we see in this feast the blowing of trumpets on the first day so that people had a 10-day heavenly trial period during which God judged each person with mercy and compassion before the execution of his judgment on the Day of Atonement. So you have a feast that begins with a trumpet sound and 10 days later you have the Day of Atonement where if you are under the blood, then you get mercy. If you're outside of the blood, you get judgment. And so, um, right now, for us, not just prophetically on God's calendar, we, our next festival is the Festival of Trumpets, okay? But even in our calendar year, right now, we are in... Um, day four of that 10-day grace period before the Day of Atonement. September, the evening of September 13th was the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Today is the 17th. The evening of the radio show, the 22nd, is the last day before the Day of Atonement begins. And that's where either mercy or judgment truly falls, depending on where you are in the covenant. And then we have um, the 23rd, which is the Day of Atonement, the holiest day of the year. Hey, Al. No, that's okay. I'm actually filming right now in a service, and that's why I answered the call. Because I'm actually just got into the question I called you about earlier today. And I was wondering if you could explain the difference. If you could just talk a little bit from a Jewish perspective about this, <laughs> this time that we're entering in. The Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets. Just the, the, the part that you would know that you think might be relevant. Is that, is that be possible? Uh, right. The, the 13th begins the, um, the new year, and then the, yeah. and then, is the right, and I was just wondering if you could just talk a little bit from your family's perspective on, on the feast, if, you know, that type of thing. Well, seven times is the remission of sin. That's how you would, the Jewish people get together and they don't drink the wine because it's, it's dirty after you, you dip your pinky in and shake it off and you dip it seven times. That cleanses you of all sin. So the blood, the wine representing blood in the New Testament would have to, uh, you know, that's part of that, you know, Jesus shed his blood. But that was the way that they only had one day out of the year given of their sins. Now they sinned the day after. They had to wait 364 days till next year to get rid of their sin. Which Jesus must have known. Man, that is pretty lame, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. You didn't know that, did you? That it was the only, the only day of remission of sin in the Jewish religion is, a, is, a, is the one day. Is a, is a young Kippur? No, it's a... Uh, yeah. And, and and so so as we're as we're moving forward here, what I also hear you saying is, Jesus being our day of atonement means that we don't have to go the bulk of the year with a sin consciousness. There's a, there's a preach in that. There's absolutely. I don't know if I've ever heard. Of, if anyone did it, uh, the Perry Stone or Rock Parts, because they're experts on Jewish holidays. But all I can know is about my own experience, and I knew, and I would ask, well, what are we doing? What, what's this all about? And that wine was dirty, and it was full of sin. Everyone got the, he passed the cup around. It started with the head of the table, the head of the household. And 
he would pray every time he dipped. There was a prayer that uh, I don't know who I would even call. Oh, my grandparents were all dead. Uh, uh, my mom wouldn't even know that prayer. Pray for her. She's out of the time there. Sure. Uh, she got hooked on the uh, stuffing envelopes with $20 bills. You want a new car? You want $10 million? And my sister had to take over. Sure. Well, for for the for the purpose of, of the feast, and, and we definitely are praying for your mom. Definitely have, and definitely will. But it, I've got you know some folks that are listening in. Um, would you care to to talk? How did your family celebrate this? I mean, what 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 went on in, in the Day of Atonement, and then the, the Feast of Tabernacles, and Feast of Trumpets, did you guys celebrate that? Did, was that something that was a part of were kind of, I would come home and the table would be, be set. I would know that it was a, he was not, not following it and not, you know, you know I, I wasn't uh, practicing, studying yeshiva boy, getting ready to go to, to yeshiva, which is a Jewish college. And I was just, you know, just something with that inconvenience. I want to get out with my friends. But when I knew the table was set for the high holy days, then I would have to just settle down for a minute and, and let them, because my mom would be cooking all day, all kinds of wonderful things to eat. And then there was the praying in Hebrew, which I didn't understand the language. My dad, mom, and dad could read it from the Bible. But I didn't know they weren't interpreting. It was difficult as a young Jewish boy growing up in that particular environment. Uh, there's just so much of the stuff that stuck, though. I knew that that was the end of the line was the remission of sin. And then as I got older, I put the two together with Jesus' and blood, and we don't have to wait. And when we sin, the scripture sin, we just bow our head and ask for forgiveness and try to go the other way, and we'll be forgiven of our sins. Let me ask you this question. Um, because in a lot of the teaching that's out there, a lot of it's doom and gloom, but isn't it safe to say, what I'm hearing you say is that God is calling us to a feast. God is, is calling us to a festival to say, hey, come eat with your family, come partake of my blood, come partake of my food, um, come, don't resist, but come to my high holy day, come, come to my son Jesus, I'm calling you to a feast. The blood moons, the, the feast or tabernacles, to me... I don't think it's just doom and gloom. Of course, if you're outside the blood covenant, it's going to be doom and gloom. But if you're in the covenant, it seems like to me, God is calling us to a party, calling us to a festival, a holy one. And then, and then if you do it right, you're also calling to the world to say, guys, you can come too. Just come through Yeshua. Just come through Jesus. Is that, is that correct? It is. It, every, it, it is the year. Well, that all makes sense, man, with the blood moon and the forgiveness of sin. And uh, uh, all debts are canceled every seven years, from what I understand. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and what's going on in, in my life, I'm, you know, I got a, I'm working on a windfall to buy this piece of property to open up a larger church that we're going to get a lot of people saved and a lot of young kids and Christians uh, that like to do music. And we're moving forward with that uh, club that I talked to you about. And it just so happened that we got a phone call that they had really dropped the price significantly. And I'm closing on a on a piece of property on the 28th of this month. So things are starting to really blossom for need our ministry. Thank God we've been praying for increase and we believe in increase. And we believe in fruit. This may be a big basket of fruit that we can show the world that we love Jesus and that we're building we're kingdom building we're not so much trying to build a bigger church and show off we're not doing that we're, we're trying to be more effective to help more people and lead more people to Christ and it's hard for a flower to grow in a little tiny flower pot sometimes we need to put them in a bigger pot and 
lots of soil on that. That flower can really bloom. We'll have lots of rooms, and we're still going to stay with the, uh, you know, with the uh, covered meeting, which is uh, the grandfather of Celebrate Recovery. It was around before Celebrate Recovery. The 12 strip Christian program, all Christian-based biblical uh, alignment for sobriety and, and people with addictions. Well, it's still, it's still it, going to be our bread and butter when it's we come from. If, I, if I'm looking at this calendar correctly, the Day of Atonement is the 23rd. Um, that's also the holiest day of the year. It also it begins the year of Jubilee on the 23rd. And then the 28th is the fourth of the blood moons. Um, and it also begins the Feast of Tabernacles, which you know, of course, is God saying, this is my desire to tabernacle with man. And I want to, to, to dwell with man. The 28th, the day that you close on that property to increase your church is the, the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles, which, you know, you and I have been talking about this for several years that you've been pursuing this. And, and the fact that God has made you wait till the 28th, after all these years, to get that property on that day of this year, I don't think, I, I think God is saying, I'm going to do it when I want to do it. I've got a day I'm going to do it. If you look at my calendar, I'm doing it like I always have. And Absolutely. This is such a God thing. I've never been more sure of it in my life. And, and, you know, we, we always pray. You know, we pray, Lord, to open doors, no men close, close doors, no men can open. But, and we're wondering, and why is it taking so long? Why are these people, uh, they, I mean, I'd rather die than let a church take this building over. Well, we had one guy died after that was said, and then another guy wound up in the hospital. These guys are anti-church with me. We're not going to talk bad about them. What we're going to do is just say that the Holy Spirit had finally aligned himself with these guys to, to give a, a date and, a, and, and when it's going to be available and, and providing the, the finances. <coughs> oh, I mean, it's just unbelievable. I mean, just I got people that just can't believe what they're doing. I tell them what's going on. Uh, and now with this, shedding another whole light on it, I I hope you can, you can talk to my wife about those dates because, you know, even though I come from that background, I'm not really up, up to date like, like a Rod Marsley or, or a uh, Harry Stone. You know, they just know those dates and the significances. And, you know, it's not my long suit, but I do have a lot of personal experience growing up in it as a child. Yes, it was a feast. It was a wonderful feast. It was every kind of thing you can think of, and, and it was a getting rid of a sense until next year and, and wow you blew me away with these dates here <laughs> well well let me call you back um, after service and talk some more or even tomorrow and I'll jump back in and finish filming up here what we're filming sounds wonderful love you I'll talk to you soon love you bye 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 yeah that just happens to be a messianic Jew that's the husband of the pastor in Florida that we um, go down there and, you know, all that. So, and I'd called him earlier today to talk about um, a particular thing, and I, I heard the Holy Spirit say, just, just take this call and work it into this. So, um, yeah, can you imagine? Um, it just, as he was talking, on this Day of Atonement, according to the Old Testament, you're clean that day. But <laughs> as soon as you sin again, you got to wait 364 more days to get clean again. You know, by the, by that, that that day rolls around next year, man, you're loaded down. I mean, you're just, it would seem like all year, the, it would, the condemnation of the devil, you know, the sin consciousness. One more reason to celebrate Jesus as our day of atonement, which is the 23rd, which is six days from now. Um, one more reason to appreciate Christ in the way that he has made it possible not only to get sins for forever forgiven, but when we sin on the other side of that forgiveness, we have an advocate with the Father. And then he is, when we confess our sin, 1 John 1 and 9, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us. Right then and right there, we don't have to wait um, another year or almost a year to do it. Um, this, and, and he's closing on a building down there we're talking about that's going to, oh, I, 
it's five, ten times the size of the building they have now. They have a storefront next to a bar and a little area there, and this place is around the corner, and it's 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 as big as this building, and then it's got a yard, you know, football field yard, and space, and which is huge down in Florida <coughs> to have such to have such you know stuff like that where they can do concerts and bonfires and whatnot. So with that said. Uh, he's been waiting for several years for that deal to close and then all of a sudden the price drops and they're going to close on the 28th uh, the beginning of the Feast of Tabernacles and the whole idea is that it's church and tabernacling with man you know you, you can <laughs> the whole thing is significant really significant wonder what's going to happen for us uh, during these 21 days um, Lots of things in here from September the 13th to October the 4th, which is the last day of the Feast or Tabernacles, uh, is 21 days. Why is that number significant? It jumps out at me for two reasons. Number one, Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 days. And then the world tells you that it takes 21 days to start a new habit. And there's something about that, you know. The first day of the year being September 13th uh, was also a partial solar eclipse. And because the world goes by a sun calendar, uh, that typically speaks of ominous things for the world if they're not right with God. And um, then it was also the Jewish New Year. I want to interject this in here in our Feast of Trumpets on our, our 21 days here. They would blow a horn to start the day. I want to take a look at that for a second and show you something. Um, the Feast of Trumpets is, is often called, um, or Rosh Hashanah, is often called the Hidden Day. Now we're going to incorporate this into the Rapture, because there's a lot of people that believe that while we don't know the day or the hour of the Rapture, we can know the season. And the context would be this fall season, and it would be the season of the Feast of Trumpets. And... One of the reasons why somebody would say, well, well, the reason Jesus said that we don't know the day or the hour is because of this that I'm about to tell you right here. Um, if you go to Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, I want to show you something here. Um, during the temple times, there was two guys that would go to witnesses that would go to the top of this mountain and they would, as soon as the sun was setting, you know, you can look over the mountain and see the sun begin to set, they would um, light a fire for the guy in the temple to blow the horn. And when they went through the diaspora, uh, they weren't sure whether it was one of two days as to when that trumpet began. They could never tell which one from year to year. They would just have to go up in the mountain and look and see when the new moon, uh, when that season would begin. And so um, that's why it's called the hidden day. And they would say, I don't know what day the Feast of Trumpets is going to start next year because we don't know whether it's going to be this day or that day. No man knows the day. And so when Jesus said, well, well let's just look at some of these things here. Uh, look at Zephaniah 2, 1 through 4. Gather yourselves together, gather together, O nation not desired. Bef before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, um, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Uh, for Gaza shall be forsaken, Ashkelon desolation. They shall drive at Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. The Feast of Trumpets is, is a picture of this right here, saying, hey, when you hear that trumpet sound, rend your heart, not your garments, and get right with God. Because in 10 days, there's coming a judgment. In Isaiah chapter 26, uh, looking at verses 20 and 21, we'll see this. Come.
Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. I mean, because of this, the sounding of the trumpet, because of, hey, this is God saying, get right, get ready, there's judgment coming. Most folks believe the rapture is going to take place in the Feast of Trumpets. Um, what happens when the church is raptured? The judgment of God falls on the earth. And so what we're having right now, and, and, and in a second I'll show you, um, well, the Bible will show you where, well, I'll tell you what, won't you just look, take a look. First Thessalonians chapter 4, let me show you this kind of tie this together here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 11. Why don't we just start right there? 1 Thessalonians 4 and 11. That you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly towards them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. Lack is not of God. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And uh, look over at First Thess uh, 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty two. It says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. Um, the reason it says the last trump is because in the Feast of Trumpets, the, trump, the trumpet would sound 100 times in that day. And the last of those 100 was called the last trump. Uh, we talked a few weeks ago about the number of incidences around the world where you're hearing trumpet sounds just randomly out of the blue. The whole thing is surreal when you look at it. When you, when you think about God's perspective and God's timetable and you're hearing all these trumpet sound, you're going to hear a hundred. And then the last one, he's going to say, come up hither. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 24. And it's verse 30 through 31. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven unto the other. If you look at Revelation 4 and 1, John is uh, in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And it says, After this I looked, verse 1, and behold, the door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things which must be hereafter. And the teaching here is Revelation 1, 2, and 3 is all written to the church. And from the time he hears this trumpet sound, the church is in heaven. And you don't see the church again until Revelation 19, coming with Jesus on the clouds and white horses. I mean, you see them, they're up in heaven as a sea of glass. But they're not down here between Revelation 4 and Revelation 19, when the earth is being judged during that seven-year period of time. So we're getting all excited about this season that we're in right now, because Jesus could come right now tonight. And it would be so accurate 
biblically and prophetically because of the time of year that it is, the, the four blood moons, um, the day of atonement, the year of jubilee. You talk about all the debts are forgiven. I mean, he, this would be a year where he sure could come between now and the 22nd. If he doesn't come, well, then there's the blessings that we talked about in Joel being poured out. So it's just as good as it can be on earth, barring the rapture during this time of year. I hope we've answered some questions tonight. That's definitely not all we could get into, um, but it is a good, good bit. And I think, uh, you know, we, lest we beat a dead horse here, I think we'll just take a minute and uh, catch our breaths and we'll call this part one and then I guess come back uh, in a minute and do part two.